Hi, everyone, and welcome to SPED Homeschool Conversations. We're so happy to have you here with us tonight. Um, once again, we're having another discussion about curriculum and not like you think is in curriculum. We're going to tell you what curriculum is the best. We're going to tell you about how to look at curriculum and maybe in some creative ways. And tonight we're going to be talking about how to choose effective and appropriate curriculum with Judy Monday. Welcome, Judy. We're so glad Hi. to have you here tonight. Thank you. Hi. Um, so Judy has wrote this very extensive book, and I want to show everybody what it looks like. Um, it's called Teaching a Child with Special Needs at Home and at School. And it is like the encyclopedia of what you need to know. And we're only going to cover one chapter in this hour because it is so meaty, but um, we'll definitely be talking more about um, how you can get this book. And, um, you know, I thought I would start out this conversation, Judy, with you just explaining to us why you wrote this book. Mm -hmm. And um, just where did all, you know, how did you gain all this information? Because it's so mm -hmm. good and it's so good for parents to just dive into when they have a child that struggles and they're going, what do I do and how do I teach them? And um, it, you've been there. Oh, yes. oh, <laughs> and yeah. that's, that's where that comes from, doesn't it? It does. It does. Um, I started working with kids who had special needs almost 30 years ago. Mm. And um, at that point, I didn't really almost know where to begin. Um, I did not homeschool, but all 10 of my grandchildren have been homeschooled. And we now have three in university and one on their way. Wow. So obviously their moms have done a spectacular job. Mm. Um, but as, I, as I've gone through the first 10 years, the Lord had me in public school. So I learned how to help parents who are coming out of the public school because the public schools weren't meeting the needs of their children. Yeah, we're hearing that more and more now. And it's a serious concern. And, and I didn't understand why the Lord wanted me there at the time. But now I know because I can use that background information to help them transition. Right. So that was, that was one place that I found I had a, a niche to be trained for that. But then the next 20 years, I've been working with kids who have been homeschooled. And mm -hmm. the same needs just kept coming up over and over again. Yeah, um, they do. And I was getting calls. I would tell you probably at least half of the calls started out with, I feel like I'm failing my child. Oh, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that too. Yeah, exactly. and, and it breaks my heart. And, and yet I knew there wasn't enough of me to go around. Right. So even though I was speaking at workshops, it just it became a burden on my heart. I needed to get this into more people's hands than I could possibly reach one on one. Right. So I began this project um, in actually about early 2016. It took me a full year to write it. Mm. Uh, it's an interesting project when you try to put down everything you've learned over 30 years. And, <laughs> oh, yeah. Definitely. And, and I, I, I made the mistake and yet a wonderful blessing of having my husband as my editor. And oh. he, he has done PhD theses and he was a stickler for every comma, every period. Mm. And, and he would ask me, um, what's your reference for this? And I'd say, well, it's what I used and I know it works. He said, that's not enough. You have to have citations and resources and footnotes. Wow. And I didn't want to put the footnotes where they would cause people to get hung up as they were going through the book. So I checked right. them all in the back. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's it's become both my legacy and I hope uh, an outreach for those parents that really feel like they want to know more about how to help the child who's struggling. And mm -hmm. I made it very practical, very hands on. Yes, you have. Definitely. Uh, it's, it's been my heart to make something so that you can take it and actually put it to work without feeling like you need a special ed degree. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah, it was funny. I was talking to one of my team members today and she does have a special ed degree and she goes, I still don't feel like I know what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's, you know, some of that training comes in handy, but then she said it almost hangs me up too. Because, and a lot. Okay. Yeah. Oh, just because that she, it was supposed to work in the classroom and it doesn't work at home. <laughs> and in some cases, the parent, the teachers who have had that training are given situations where it's not enough. Exactly. You know, they have maybe eight kids in a public school classroom of all different needs. And what are you going to do? Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And we don't often look at that as parents that teachers in the public schools fail all the time. We think, now that I've got this child, I'm just supposed to succeed with them. But <laughs> failure is a lesson. And yeah. and we have to take those takeaways and learn about our child. And I think that's a lot what we're going to talk about tonight is about learning about our child so we can choose effective and appropriate curriculum. Yes. 
Yeah, and and my background is such that um, in my first master's degree back in the 60s, um, I took a course working with the kids who were in what was called Head Start. And oh, that, yes. may, that may be even before a lot of the moms we're listening to tonight have been born. But, <laughs> um, you know, it was before my 50-year-old son was born. So it was a long time ago. But Head Start was very much about finding something that worked to help these children come from very little background knowledge to a place where they could publicly work in the public school at that time. That was the goal. But the uh, perspective that I was taught was one called direct instruction. Find the weakest place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Enter right in where the child's weak point starts and build the foundation upward and not try to jump in because the textbook said you need to go ahead. Right. Yes. So that's one key thing that I share in workshops is um, you are in charge of the textbook. You are in charge of what you're doing. Don't let the book tell you where you're supposed to be. You, you do what works. Mm -hmm. I, even just you telling uh, our parents this, you know, I, it, it should give them like a sigh of relief. And I remember when I very, my very first year of homeschooling, I read a curriculum, the one that I used, and it said, do not do everything that's in this book. It was really? not meant to be done. It was a unit study approach. It was Konos. Wow. And she said, you pick and choose what meets your child's need. And I, it was like this, huh, this yeah. weight. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't have to do it all because right. it all isn't meant for my child. Um, you, and you were I, fortunate to hear it to start out like that. Exactly. I think a lot of us like drive ourselves into the ground when we don't hear that at the beginning because mm -hmm. we think mm -hmm. we have to do it all. Um, right. I just want to let our viewers know because I know we have some viewers on um, that if you have questions or comments um, while we're going along for Judy or the topic we're talking about how to choose effective and appropriate curriculum, if you just want to ask a question, type it in in the feed down below and um, and let us know so that um, so we can get to those questions while we're talking. So, right. yeah. Right. Yeah. So what I guess the first question is, what is appropriate curriculum? Okay. We're going to talk about that. Yeah. Um, what, I, what I try to share with any parent who asks is not a particular brand. I, I never will recommend a particular brand. I may say that there are a couple of companies that I know whose products are continually a source of frustration for homeschool kids with special needs. So I will mention those by name, but generally I, I more often will say the appropriate curriculum is one in which you are able to pace the content and pick the materials that your child can learn from. Mm. It may look like a great curriculum. It may be loaded with great pictures and great exercises and lots of memory work or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if it's not working for your child, it's not appropriate. That's it's it. it's similar. It's similar to choosing a garment. It may be the most high fashion thing in Paris, but it may not be appropriate for you for church on Sunday. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> so we have to find we have to find something that is going to be a good match for the child and the child's particular limits and the child's strengths. And yeah. you may be able to supplement it and build on the strengths, but you really can't make too many um, mistakes trying to make sure you pick what works. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and and I always tell parents too, you know, trying things out before investing a lot of money. Um, so many of these curriculum companies now offer free samples and okay. Okay. yes, they do. And, and even just asking if you don't find it on their website, say, I just like a lesson. This is where my child I think is at. We want to try it out. They're more than likely to give you something. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I found. Um, I'm actually speaking at the homeschool trade associations conference and talking to curriculum developers about the ways that they need to be thinking about our parents and how they're looking at their curriculum as well. But, um, but a lot of them really want to work with our families um, and to see if, you know, help them find out a good fit, um, at least the ones I've interviewed. Um, and so. and the, the other important thing with that is that even if you started with a curriculum, it doesn't mean that you are honor bound to keep it for the whole year. If it's not working, please feel free to drop it and try something different. And I know that sometimes means that there can be an expense involved. Right. But the, the midway point between those two is a separate conference, which we could have about how to make accommodations. Yes. For example, if it says timed tests for math facts, your accommodation could be as simple as saying, don't time the child. 
Right. If the child's having trouble copying math problems, then you Xerox it. Or if mm -hmm. the child can't work in the space in the workbook, enlarge it or hand copy the problems on graph paper. Mm -hmm. There are many ways that you can adapt and still keep the same textbook that you've got. Right. Yeah. And we often think of that as cheating, but it is not. Um, in the public schools, they call that accommodating, like you yep. were talking about. And when you can allow your child in the deficits that they have, you know, an accommodation is basically bringing them to an even playing field. That's right. That's right. Finding something that you can use, not necessarily to throw out the book, but to change mm -hmm. the way you approach it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's what makes it so important that a parent feels that they have the liberty and actually use their own wisdom to choose how to make that work. And that's one of the things that I put in the, in the book that I did write, which is there's a, there's a wealth of ideas on how to do those accommodations without having to spend hours of planning time. Mm -hmm. Or to you don't have to be the most creative person in the world. Because no. <laughs> I think we think that it's like, oh, I can't think of all these things. Well, there's resources for you, like your book. Um, and I always tell, tell parents when they write IEP goals, there's goal banks. Guess what? Those special ed teachers, they use them too. Yes, they do. <laughs> so Absolutely. You should, be, um, you should be thinking about that as well. So we have a question here. Yes. Um, Michelle said, um, thoughts and opinions on BJU Press and second level. I used it last year, reduced spelling words, reduced math problems. I let them orally do a lot of answers versus writing. When should I push the writing? Well, okay. um, my first question to you is how old is he and what is his cognitive level? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have any other questions for her. Yeah, if, if writing is a problem, there may be, um, it's a fine motor problem. It could mm -hmm. be that there's an actual dysgraphia. If the child is able to do some of the work orally, um, then I would say that you found something that works. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if, if it's necessary and you want to push the writing, then you have to look at how how well is he able to form the letters? How well is he able to form the numbers? Because then you're fighting two battles. You're trying to also push not only the content, but wrestle into that. Can he figure out where to put the pencil and what direction to pull it? What direction mm -hmm. to, to lift it up and connect it to the next number? Mm -hmm. um, so if there's a serious problem with writing that's pervasive across the curriculum, it may be a good time to, to think about maybe needing to get testing for learning disabilities if it's, if it's consistent. If it's not impeding his progress, then just you can kind of relax about it and reduce the amount of writing you require for the time being. Yeah, so she added, he's nine years old, autism, uh, mm -hmm. SPD, ADHD, he can write, it's his spelling and creativity. Oh, autism, yeah, definitely creativity um, <laughs> and writing. I totally get that, that's where my, my son is. Sequencing is his biggest issue. And, and with the kids on the spectrum, they do have a hard time putting their thoughts into words. Exactly. And so yeah. if you if you found a way that he's able to to produce some work for you at the oral level, then I would say that that, that would be a direction that I would stay with uh, mm -hmm. for the time being. Yeah. yeah. Reduce the I, amount of writing. I even tell parents to dictate. You know, they can now use Google Docs. You can actually mm -hmm. dictate word to text. Um, if he has something that he wants to do, I know for my son on the autism spectrum, doing reports that were not creative, but um, that were factual were much easier for him. He's an engineer. I mean, he's going to school to be an engineer now. Right. He, he never had the creativity for a creative writer that tells gives novels. And yeah. you know what? That's okay. <laughs> right. I heard of Temple Grandin. Um, Temple Grandin is, of course, the world famous autistic writer who's an author and a scientist. And she believes from the conversation that I heard in a, in a workshop she gave that probably half the, half the engineers in Silicon Valley are on the spectrum mm -hmm. because that's their forte. Yeah. And, and I have a, a son on the spectrum, um, high functioning, but nevertheless, he's all engineer. Mm -hmm. He's all engineer, always was. And, and that's his excellence. So, you know, right. it's, it's, you know, don't, don't try to fit that round peg into a triangular shaped hole because it's not going to work. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so Michelle, I, I hope that's encouraging to you. Yeah, you know, the, the spelling, I know, do you have any suggestions for the spelling as well? Um, I have some sections. Uh, the, di the word dictate, at nine years old, it's probably still too early to start using a much of the, of the, the voice right. dictation programs. Um, 
if if he's got a sound phonics based, I would start using the phonics based materials to create your spelling list. I don't know where her spelling lists are coming from. Um, right. BJU is likely to probably have a more random array of words rather than a, a word family. So I, I think if you stay with right. word families, you're going to find that it's easier for him to build those internal rules that are part of the way the spectrum kids think. Exactly. Yeah, I found those to be much more so like sequential spelling is a really mm -hmm. good one because they right. do build up those word families. Yeah, right. I think I think that's a better way for her to try to um, establish some foundations. And of course, uh, I read a wonderful book years ago called Beginning to Read, and the author points out that only 70 percent of our English language is phonetically consistent. Yeah. The other 30 percent come from foreign languages and break all the rules. Yes. <laughs> so we start with the ones that, that you know, you can trust. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. And then I think you that'll help. the rest. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. still, you and I, we use word check or spell check still. <laughs> you have to. Yeah, that's yep. for sure. So, and she just said, thank you. You're, You're welcome, welcome, dear. Yeah. So, um, I, I think we've already touched on this a little bit, but the one size fits all approach. Um, why don't we address that? Because I think even, you know, we get parents say, well, my child's on the spectrum. And this other parent said that this, this curriculum helps their child on the spectrum. That doesn't even work. Right. right. And why doesn't it? And why should parents or what should they do? You know, now they're thinking I'm at a total loss now. What's what's questions do I ask? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's the hardest question in the world to answer in a way. And yet, if you if you put yourself in a mindset of thinking about clothes shopping, you know, it, it can be the greatest fashion statement. And yet it's not going to be a good fit for your kid or it may not look right or it may not be the right size, even though it says size 12 and you bought it at a Kmart. It may not fit if you bought it at a, a fancy Macy's or someplace. Right. So even though it says it's the right size, it's important again to ask yourself, is it working for my child? And if it's not, you can either make those accommodations like I suggested, mm -hmm. um, because I think you have to be willing to be flexible. Um, so one size really almost never fits all. Even in the public school, we're finding that's that's the, the key weak link in the whole public school system. It's they don't all pace at the same level. They don't all pace at the same amount of content. And and it's it's a, a system guaranteed to fail. Right. I had a mom ask me yesterday. She's like, well, my, my goal is, is to get through this curriculum in one year. And she's like, but I don't think we can make it in one year. And I said, well, then what about two? And she looked at me like, are you kidding me? I have to make it last two years. I'm like, if that's the pace your child is going, yes, because... Yes. Otherwise, you make gaps. There's That's you're going to have huge gaps that then your child's going to be even struggling more. Yeah. And yeah. My my goal would be to, to to find something where you can teach to mastery, even if it's a limited amount yes. of content you cover. Mm -hmm. You want to teach to mastery because that's the only way you have those strong foundations to build on. Right. So um, if, mm -hmm. if it's going to take you know, and and at some point, it maybe will wise to just say, is this a hill I'm willing to die for? I have a lot of moms who say my child can't learn the times facts. He's 11 years old and he still hasn't gotten the times facts. Right. That doesn't mean that he can't learn other math concepts and it's time to talk about a calculator because that child as an adult is going to need that as a life skill. So which hills are you willing to die for in order to make that one size fit everybody? And the answer is that's that's a, that's a call you have to make as a parent. Mm-hmm. So true. And I, I, I like what you say about that, because we, I did an interview a while ago with some math curriculum developers, and they said, yes, you know, math, we, we tend to lump it all into math is math, you know, like functions, but it's not. We have yeah. different forms of math. And yes, the memorization part is is sometimes really hard for kids. And if you can give them the accommodation of just a multiplication sheet, they're going to still be learning, yeah. uh, looking at that sheet. And maybe they're a child that just intakes information, you know, visually, they'll they'll actually learn their times tables while using that accommodation. That's right. And that's often the thing that we tend to overlook. I'm a I'm a math dyslexic or dyscalculaic myself, but because my father was an accountant, he couldn't understand why I couldn't get math. And so it generated a lot of math anxiety. Um and I, I got to feeling like I'm not very smart because I can't mm -hmm. I can't do algebra and I have no clue what they're talking about. And so it, it became important for me to understand 
what it would take to help teach a child in a way that they can learn. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. one one thing that I, I add in the book, which is, it sounds like a, a almost counterintuitive, but if a child's learning a new math problem, a new kind of math problem, let's say it's a simple long division with a single divisor, mm -hmm. there are many, many components to being able to do that long division problem. It's huge sequencing. Lots of yeah. sequencing. So what I would suggest in those cases is do that one problem over and over till the process becomes automatic. And you're also happening to review the times fix. Yes, because then you're not changing the numbers up. And it's it, it's something that is, they're, mm -hmm. they're embedding that. That's an awesome idea. I've never heard that before. That's great. And it's, it's worked like a charm for some mm -hmm. students that I've taught. And then once they get that operation process down pat to the steps, then you just change one of the numbers a little tiny bit. And right. so now they're using the same process and they go, aha, I mm -hmm. can do this. And, and then you gradually can implement and increase the difficulty level. Um, mm -hmm. Said I don't recommend curriculum too much, but key math is a great little, the key curriculum books. Oh, yes. I used to tutor uh, a girl in high school. I have a degree in physics. So okay. um, done some math tutoring and I used those and they were really good because they approached math from very uh, multiple different directions and mm -hmm. and we just kept going through the process until she she got it so we got right. some more questions here okay uh, Lisa it says mine is still struggling to read he's nine I've tried everything okay yeah. what is everything yeah um, have you tried a phonics space have you tried a sight word have you used uh, teaching your child to read in 100 easy lessons um, mm -hmm. let's look, can let's we have a little bit more detail, Lisa? Yeah. So, and then, so let's go on to Marlena. Um, she said, I have an 11 year old son with autism, a SPD, ADHD, just finishing up fourth grade. He's been mainstreamed into regular class in public school, but with so many behavior issues. Yeah. We hear that a lot about that age, sure. just in puberty. Um, I'm concerned, considering homeschooling. I have no idea where to start. I'm researching different programs at this moment. Okay. Why, but since you've already been there, well, I'm going to let you take the lead on this and then I'm going to piggyback behind you. Yeah. So what we ended up doing, and I just actually published a blog post last week about what how I pick curriculum for my, my children. And I basically took three standard approaches and we tried the same subject area. On We, we covered pirates in the 17th century and I did a textbook approach and I did a unit study approach and I did a literature based approach because well, 17 years ago when I started, that's all there was. Um, and now there's online things, you know, there's there's a whole lot more <laughs> than what I, I used to. But this aha moment came to me when we, we had been, my kids didn't do textbooks well. Um, it, that was pretty easy. They didn't sit down in color. And when um, we did the literature base, you know, they're still squirmy reading about the books, um, you know, reading stuff out of books. And then we just do some hands on stuff. But when I gave them 20 feet of rope and said, well, you can use the knots that we um, that we learned and you can tie me up as long as you use the proper knots. <laughs> they were all over that. <laughs> um, so we used a unit based approach actually through high school for my oldest who is on mm -hmm. the spectrum. And he is, yeah, now going to school to be an engineer. Um, so it so worked. It worked. And you know what? And he didn't read till he was 12. Um, and I, I tell that story so often too, but we, you can't lose sight. These kids that struggle. And, you know, you said it really well, Judy, that you need to choose a curriculum that has a really good base that is worried, you know, that focuses on mastery. And if you just do a little bit at a time, it may take your child many years to learn the basics of reading. But are you introducing literature into their lives, like through audiobooks and read out yeah. louds? Yeah. Yeah. Because eventually that gap will be filled. They, they will make that leap. My son went from not reading one year, and because we had to test in Minnesota, um, where he graduated from, and the next year he was reading at college level because he had been learning the vocabulary. He he just hadn't made the connection on how to read it himself until he, mm -hmm. you know, he hit that one point. Um, so, so I think, yeah, oftentimes we think that just because we're teaching to mastery and that we're going to speed up all of a sudden and, mm -hmm. and catch up, but it's at their own pace. They'll do yep. it. And, and I think another point to add to that is that um, it's important to understand for the one who wants to just start out, start slow. 
if you yeah. want to just focus on maybe reading and whatever is his particular passion. If, if it's learning about whales, then we go to videos, we go about geography, we go about math and yes. counting the whales, we go about mm -hmm. the history and the literature and you, you find their passion and try to work with that. Mm -hmm. But start slowly. And um, I think it's also really important to emphasize that even if the child isn't reading, there is no end to the we have possibilities for teaching. And more yeah. so than when you were able to work with 17 years ago, the technology yeah. has gone off the chart. It's yeah. So find the way that, that your child is hungry to move forward and find a couple of areas to start, mom, and then build from there. Because if you, if you can catch him on his passion, you've mm -hmm. got a wonderful hook to get him interested in working with you. And, right. and be, be wide open to any number of possibilities. You don't have to find the book that works or the curriculum. And a lot mm -hmm. of the Spectrum kids will relate well to computer versions of technology and computerized learning better than taking it from a person. Yes. So if it helps to go with teaching textbooks or something else, it's a computer version of Khan Academy. If you haven't heard of Khan Academy. Yes. Khan Academy is wonderful. And very, sy very systematic, very free. Yes. <laughs> and, and you can play it over as many times as you want to. Right. So my suggestion would be start slow until you both kind of found your, find your, find your pace and, and try to work in with things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm totally wondering agree. if Lisa is back yeah. with what she's yeah, got about. Back. Yep. She said that um, teach your child to read flashcards, leap reader, leap pad, ABC, mouse. That's a computer program, um, right. DVDs, et cetera. Okay. So. And he's nine years old. Um, I'm, I'm guessing... I know I, I actually took my first master's degree under the author of Teach Your Child to Read in 100 Lessons. Mm. Uh, it's my my experience that it's extremely well sequenced. I mean, the, the, the it was very well sequenced. Mm -hmm. what they call instructional design in terms of getting it to be organized with a very logical foundation that the kids can build on and no no jumps. Mm -hmm. But the new the, the new font that they use for teach your child to read in 100 easy lessons can be very off-putting for some students. Yeah, it was for my middle one. We ended up going to um, Hooked on Phonics. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's another good option. Mm -hmm. I just most closely, the, the sequencing and the good instructional design that I've worked with is Explode the Code. And Explode oh, the Code. Yes. We loved Explode the Code. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, and they now have an online version too, so oh, you can do. get them... I still, okay, yeah. I still encourage the use of the book to do the writing because the writing is great for practicing the sounds. And it's, and it's, and it's a very short, it's like 10, 10 minutes total mm -hmm. that you have to mm -hmm. do. And so your kids won't say, oh, I hate all this writing. So my kids hated writing too. Um, it was just that, enough. That's yeah. just enough to get a good solid Phonics books. And there's um, another book by the same publisher called Starting Comprehension, which uses the same word families. It's by epsbooks.com or EPS okay. publishers educators publishing service and it's called starting comprehension phonetically okay and so they're not only getting the decoding with explode the code but they're also then learning some basic comprehension skills like finding the main idea um is is this the right answer to this question that was in the little paragraph that you read right so it's an excellent pairing um, i've used it i've used it with some numbers of kids michelle i see has used the explode the code um it's, I found it worked really well. My, my most challenging student was one that was born under mm -hmm. two pounds. And it took us a couple of years to get him fluently where he could actually tell what letter sound came first. And for mm -hmm. him, I used Thomas the train and the engine was always the first mm -hmm. letter in the word. And so we read the engine and we sounded out from there. Uh -huh. um, and it took us about three years to get past Thomas the train, but mm -hmm. the explode the code sequencing was very helpful for him. So you have to be creative. You have to be right. creative. Yeah, you do. And and there are, yeah, the oldies but goodies. Explode the Code was definitely one of our favorites. And, mm -hmm. you know, even though I, my daughter never struggled, I still ended up using Handwriting Without Tears and Explode the Code with her because I, after teaching two that had issues, I already knew it as a parent. So, and it did work. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's so well, if, if I may, can I can I move on to something just about what makes curriculum effective? I, I would love that. Yes. Let's All right. talk about um, that. And if anybody has some questions, we'll peer on later. Mm -hmm. All right. We've talked about being appropriate, being something that really works for your child and mm -hmm. moving it in a way and tweaking it wherever you necessarily have to, to make sure that it's working for your child. But yeah. what you want to look for is you're shopping for curriculum, not for a brand, 
But first of all, I think it's important that when you teach, you want to make sure that you know what you're teaching and the child, especially the older kids, you want to tell them this is what we're going to learn today because you've given them a mental magnet that everything's going to hook on to, especially when you're working with high school and middle school students. Mm -hmm. Like, why am Martha, am I doing this today? <laughs> yeah, you get that a question a lot when they um, start. The second thing that's important in good curriculum is it's going to show the child how what they're learning today is connected to what they already know. Yes. Because I think there's one particular math book that hops around and changes topics regularly, almost with every lesson. And that mm. doesn't give them that building of connection that I think is more effective for kids with struggling learners. Yeah, that spiral learning that comes back and oh yeah, oh yeah, again. that's so important. Mm -hmm. um, next thing I think would be you want to have opportunities for practice that is meaningful. And there's a term that we use in education called engaged learning, where mm -hmm. it's not just reading through; it's actually using it and either restating it or explaining mm -hmm. it to somebody. Um, I just found a research article last week about when you have to restate if possible. Now, this is hard for kids with, with autism to try and put their thoughts into words. Sometimes they may be more nonverbal than not. But if possible, when you can explain it or you can apply it, the, the mm -hmm. practice will lock it in in more ways than just reading it. I, I've often said that middle school students tend to study by letting their eyes run down the page, but their brain is somewhere else. They're, exactly. they're not with you at all. Right. So stopping. Yeah, I even found stopping and asking. So what do they mean by that? Exactly. You know, or just exactly. interjecting. It's, it's called prompting, too. Mm -hmm. that, That's really important. Mm -hmm. Another thing you want to look for is, and this can apply to software as well as to books, are the examples that they use to introduce something unambiguous? Or do they try that may be showing two or three new things instead of just one new thing at a time? Oh, and so yeah. oftentimes that's, but math books are particularly guilty about that. Um, mm. I found with dictionary definitions, they'll often use the same word in the definition, which is clueless. I, so mm. when I teach my kids vocabulary on tutoring situations, I would ask them to put it in their own words. If they're not good at expressing it in their own words, draw me a picture. Because oh, if yes. you can draw me a little stick picture, you've already thought through the definition of that word enough to trigger its association in your mind. But too yeah, often yeah. text mm -hmm. too often textbooks use ambiguous examples. And that mm -hmm. just particularly for spectrum kids, it's black or it's white, but that gray area is not going to land. No, it's not. And, yeah. And so the other thing they want to look for is um how it follows an orderly sequence, like we talked about and Explode the Code. But um, the thing that's particularly important in software, and this is something because more and more parents are using it, mm -hmm. is how is the child given correction? Because if all the computer does is go, me, there's no new learning, there's no opportunity to get it right a second time. And so the brain signals that went in were half right and half wrong, and guess which one's gonna last? Yeah. So you wanna exactly. check, when you're mm -hmm. trying out the software, how does it correct mistakes? Is the child going to benefit from the way it corrects their mistakes and have a chance to go back and even do it again the right way? Mm -hmm. So I think important curriculum um, are ones that both teach what they're going to do, link it to formal learning, can apply it, um, practice it meaningfully, and make sure that what you're teaching is crystal clear. This is so important for kids on the spectrum. It has to be black and white. And, I know the creative thinkers and the gifted kids are also part of our, our bunch of special needs kids. So in those cases, you, you just have fun with it and, and take it as far mm -hmm. as you can. Right. And I, I think, you know, going back to all those computer programs and things, you know, the, the good ones have, you know, the, if the kids try and then they can't get through it, then they'll walk them step by step through it instead of just saying it's right or it's wrong. And, you know, they don't give, they get so frustrated. I remember my, my oldest getting so frustrated when computer programs were new and I realized the developers were just starting to use that. And I, I probably dove into them too quickly. And, um, and they didn't have that teaching component. It was just like, almost like throw material at them, then test them. Right. Chase, the, chase the rabbit across all the alphabet blocks and things like that. Yeah. Right. And one exactly. other thing, I, one other thing I want to add, if they're teaching phonics, one of, the, one of the things that happens very unfortunately in public school is the public school teachers are taught the kids 
to, I said that sentence all wrong. Let me edit the tape and go over it. Okay. Teacher, teachers are taught kids have phonics by teaching the consonant sounds like this. M, B, K, D, F, H. I visited a first, room, first grade classroom and the teacher said, all right, boys and girls, let's sound out this word. K, A, T. What's the word? It's not cat, it's ka-ata. And yeah. so for kids with processing problems, you've given them extra sounds that their poor little brain has to erase to get the word right. So right. when you're listening to those programs that teach phonics, you have to listen to those sounds and make sure they're clean. Like say each, it, it, I've described it in my book, it's hard to do, but I'll I have a chance to do it now, I'm gonna do it live. Yeah, I'll do it live. <laughs> put, a short, put a short I in front of each consonant, ib. Ick, id, if, ig, i, and, mm -hmm. and go through it. And because the consonant sound is clean at the end like that, and that's the way the consonant should be pronounced on your teaching software. Yeah. Ib. Here, just the b, not a b, but b. Right. It has to be that blend. <laughs> and yes. that lets them blend it together. If you're trying to blend b, o, with b, l, you're going to get b, l. You're not going to get b, l, b. So it's right. just listen to how the sounds are sounded out. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So we got a couple questions from okay. Charity. She says, are you familiar with master books? Um, the curriculum is a Charlotte Mason approach to teaching. I am not familiar with that, but maybe you are. Um, I've heard of them. I know the Charlotte Mason method. A lot of our parents swear by it. Um, it is definitely more of a unit natural based. Um, and for kids that are really into to nature and a lot of hands on learning, those work really well. Yes. I know the Charlotte Mason, yeah. Mason approach is very good for that. Um, it, and it would not be what they call a direct instruction approach where you actually present the principles. The kids have to kind of get them as they right. go through it's, what it's they're doing. Discovery based learning. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. um, discovery based learning works really well for kids that don't need as much of that sequence and they tend to, you know, they're absorbed in one subject and you want to build off of that. Um, but, but again, you know, you're Know your child. You have to know your child, exactly. Yeah. And then um, Charity's other question was another thought on Skillbo. Um, it's a computer program. Tried elephant learning, but that was not effective for us at all. I know I've seen a lot of advertisements for elephant learning. I have not heard any parents even talk about that. No. Skillbo, I haven't heard of um, any comments either way either. I usually go off of what my parents are recommending. Um, we have a... Um, on our website, we do a poll every year from our parents on what they found most effective. And so that at least you have somewhere to start with a list. And, um, you know, it's anything from classic to, you know, the Charlotte Mason approach to unit studies to computer right. programs. It, it, like you were saying earlier, Judy, it depends on the child and also the, the parent as well and mm -hmm. what you're mm -hmm. comfortable with teaching. Right, yeah, you would not want to pick a curriculum charity on what, um, somebody else says works well for them because you really do have to take a look at it um, and as you said Peggy some of these curriculum will actually give you a chance to try a page or two from their lesson or listen to the software whenever mm -hmm. I when I consider a software program to recommend I'm, I'm going to try the demo and yeah. I'm going to look at whether they have a good sequence whether they correct mistakes you meaningfully mm -hmm. um, so it's got to be engaging but it's got to be good instruction yeah yeah, definitely. So, so don't get bought in just because somebody loves it. Yeah, yeah. So um, you also talk about a child's reading level mm -hmm. and curriculum. And what is the importance of knowing where your child's at with their reading level when you look at curriculum? Because that really does matter. Mm -hmm. Um, if you were if you were going through a teacher education class, which none of the parents are going to have to do, um, mm -hmm. they talk about uh, 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 an easy level. They look about an instructional level, and they talk about um, just a kind of recreational level. Um, the important thing is you want a level where the kids are not making too many mistakes. Now there is a way to find out the reading level of a book. Um, and there's something called Fry's Readability Index, and it sounds intimidating. But it basically is a question of reading through 100 words and seeing how many syllables and how long are the sentences. The longer the sentences, the more syllables in the sentence, the more difficult the reading level. 
if you think of see dick see dick run run mm -hmm. jane run go mm -hmm. dick see spot one syllable short sentences right. if you get to a, an advanced textbook it could be we the people of the united states in order to form a more perfect union and you go on and on and this sentence goes for many many words and many right. syllables it's going to be a more difficult reading and mm -hmm. and once you've played with Fry's Readability. It's available. You can find it online anywhere on a Google search. It's just F-R-Y, Fry Readability, and you mm -hmm. can plot the reading difficulty level. When you get used to using that, in about three or four books, you can scan in and just visually almost tell. This this is going to be a little bit more difficult than I want it to be because the sentences are long. There are a lot of multi-syllable words. Mm -hmm. Another option is take your child and ask them to read out loud. If they're making more than uh, like 80% mistakes, they're going to be frustrated reading, I'm, I'm sorry, 80% accuracy. They're going to be frustrated when you ask them to read that book independently. Now, keep oh, in really? mind, keep mm -hmm. in mind that for kids with learning disabilities and dyslexia, they may make far more mistakes reading aloud than they will reading silently. It's another right, right. level of brain activity. Mm -hmm. So they may do better actually reading silently and, and unfortunately you don't know unless you ask them questions but right, if you right. want to get an idea of how they can do just give them a sample page or two from the beginning and the end of the book because mm -hmm. sometimes it's a whole lot more difficult at the end and and it could be throwing them so oh, if you if you if you're looking at that um you don't have to use fry readability, although I think it's it's not that difficult a concept. It's it's basically the concept of looking at how many syllables, multi-syllable words, and how long the sentences are. The shorter the sentences, the more one-syllable, two-syllable words, you're going to be at the lower reading level of first, second, third grade as soon yeah, as you get up there. I don't, don't think we think about this, but you know, oftentimes parents will say, well, then I don't have to worry about the, the reading level if I read out loud to them. But as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, but still the complexity of the language, that even if you're reading it out loud, you would have to completely change the structure of your, of what the, you know, what you're reading and almost simplify it to your student. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of work. So, you know, finding, finding the text that is actually explaining it where they can understand it. It's, it's the difference between the Living Bible or the message and the original King James. Right. And, and you're absolutely right. There are times when you need to reword it for your child to be able to process. And, and I will say in the last 10 years of my 30 years teaching, I've seen far more kids who have neurologically based processing issues where it's very difficult for them to hold a lot of information and answer questions or recall it. Or maybe it goes out of sequence or maybe there are dropout zones in the middle. And so they're not getting complete ideas. They're getting, and even a, a very weak decoding child is lost right. in the pro, pro, process of, and you've already gone, you've forgotten the first part of your sentence. Right. So yeah, just as parents like with that, you know, go back to doing some more neurological, like developmental things before you even press anymore on reading or, mm -hmm. or other things like that. Do, you know, like Dr. Carol Brown has the equipping minds and um, just just some of those um, those approaches for building neural nets because kids, they're not processing well because of what's what they haven't developed. Yeah, yeah. Um I'm going to answer Diane's question in just a second, but the, the process that I suggested for math where you do the same operation over and over again, mm -hmm. it actually works for teaching reading fluency so that you have a, you have a, like a hundred word passage at mm -hmm. an easy level. Mm -hmm. You have them read it out loud and you can record them. Now the competitive instinct kicks in because you say, I want you to practice this until you can read it just like you talk and I'm gonna ask you to read it. And when you think you're ready, I'm gonna tape you again. Now we can do videotape. When I first thought of this idea, oh, it was yeah. all audio. Mm -hmm. I did this with one of my granddaughters who was very slow processing and reading very slowly. And I, her mother left her with me for an hour and um, she went shopping and I had her do this. I had her practice a paragraph mm -hmm. and then I had her read it when her mom came home and she said, what did you do to her? <laughs> She was reading fluently and she sounded like she was reading with expression because once you begin to read ideas, you're learning content. Mm -hmm. If you're reading, yes. you are not reading content. 
No, because they're so focused on the next word. Mm -hmm. that, yes. Oh, that's an awesome. And it absolutely works. Um, it would have been my PhD thesis if somebody hadn't recommended it first in research before I got to it. <laughs> Diane wanted to know the reading program. I was speaking of something called Explode yes. the Code. Explode the Code. And it's available from Educators Publishing Service, I believe it is, EPS. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you should yeah. be able to find it on Amazon. Yeah, a lot of homeschool conferences carry. Um, I think there's a variety of different vendors that usually have that available. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. It's it's a it's a very solidly designed program, and it really mm -hmm. can work. And if they're if they're not making that kind of progress, you can always do the book one or book one and a half, mm -hmm. where they reteach, and you still have a chance to to re reteach some of that without it being the exact same book all over again. Right. Yes. Yeah. I forgot about that. That that is a good one. Um, charity's back. Yes. So let's look, put that question up. What age do you all recommend knowing reading levels or pushing reading levels? I hope that makes sense. My daughter knows all the letters, sounds, and we have started blending. We just started a new reading curriculum, but curious when you all started this process. For you, it was when your child was ready. Yeah, it, it really was. And each of my children, it was different because um, my second has dyslexia. And so we we did a lot of that. You know, I never pushed reading. And um, I think pushing reading, I, I've even read some some comments that it, it actually increases the, the anxiety. Uh, it will increase that, but also the 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 ability for a child to develop dyslexic um they're, if a child is a visual processor and mm -hmm. they um, they will, they, you can actually skip the, the dyslexia block by allowing them to learn to read on their own mm -hmm. if they are a more visual learner. And I found that to be true with my, my daughter because she is a visual learner. She taught herself how to read mm -hmm. uh, because I didn't push it. But my middle son, I have a feeling that his biggest struggle started because he's was sent to speech therapy when he was three. And they really pressed the reading at a really young age. Really? And, um, yeah, so I have I often tell parents, you know, to just, um, yes, we can go through the sounds, we can talk about blending, but I think the more we push it, especially at a young age, I even interviewed a literacy specialist a couple, last month and she said, they were told long ago that if a child can't do the bilateral on the monkey bars, they're not ready to learn to read mm -hmm. because it's that interaction between the sides of their brain and being able to work together with the reading process. Um, I have not heard that. Um, you haven't heard um, that. <laughs> no, but I, as I told you, you know, my, my basic background is all very much in direct instruction. And so you start at the lowest possible level where you can enter with the child and move forward from there. So right. if you're, if you're able to get the sounds and the blending, um, make it a game, make, spend as much time as you can on the blending. And I would play with word tiles where you lift the first sound off and change it into a new sound. Um, try and have the child do some things that are playing with the words as well as just reading. And um, the other thing I would suggest when you're doing that is they're blending. Um, parents tend to ask, what word is this? Or they'll ask a longer word question. And if you mm -hmm. can just tap the word, then you don't interfere with that very fragile collection of sounds that they've just assembled in their brain. So you train them that if you tap the word, you want them to say it, or you can just say what word and you're not overloading them with, tell mommy what the word is, mm. because then you've substituted, tell mommy what the word is for b-o-l-a-k, b-o-l-a-k, black. You've added mm. b-o-l-a-k, what mommy wants to know. <laughs> so, <laughs> be, right. so minimize your verbal cues as you're asking them to read. Yeah, and definitely. And that goes back to the teacher child to read in 100 Easy Lessons. That's exactly how, you know, that, it's that prompting, the simple mm -hmm. prompting, just the, the your finger underneath and, and right. following that. that. And that's what yeah. my first master's degree was in. That's that's how I think. That's how I work. That's how I teach. It's very mm -hmm. directly instructing rather than developmentally slowly moving along from one thing mm -hmm. to another. Mm -hmm. Well, Charity says that she, yes, she loves all that and is very successful at it. Wonderful. So, yeah. And, you know, and that's, that's where we want our children to be, isn't it? We want them to be successful. 
Um, and, okay. and yet, yeah, it's, um, she said, what, um, Deborah has a question for us. Um, what would you suggest I use to teach reading comprehension? And that depends on how old the child is. Mm -hmm. um, if they're a very beginning reader, like I said, the EPS books has the starting comprehension phonetically. Um, mm -hmm. I like the critical reading called uh, Reading Detective. Um, and again, I say I don't recommend curriculum too much, but Reading Detective is excellent because it not only asks a child to answer questions, but it asks them to find where in the text the answer came from. Oh, yes. And is so that it's from creative? Um, it's from criticalthinking.com. Thinking, yes, I love all their products. Mm -hmm. And really that particular good. Reading Detective is very, it's, it's good for third grade up. It has some easy material and it also has a remedial level, which is actually third and fourth, but for older kids. And then they have an older version also. Um, so, and yeah, she if said you, six. If only six, then I would be using um, the explode about the educators publishing starting comprehension material. Mm -hmm. And you can also be reading aloud to him and asking questions about asking who, questions. what, where. If he's on the spectrum, you're not going to ask the why, you're not going to ask the how. You're going to ask the who, what, um, mm -hmm. ask very fact-based questions, and that's critical. You need to be able to ask fact-based questions if he's primarily a spectrum kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The way I give the example in my workshops is um, if you're reading Three Little Bears, you know, the question may be, should Goldilocks have gone into the Three Bears' cottage? And that's a pretty high-level question. That is a, I yeah. say, did Goldilocks go in the cottage? How many bears? Mm -hmm. What bears at home? I'm asking facts. And I can still ascertain whether or not there was some level of understanding. Right. You may have yeah. when I was talking about accommodations, that's another accommodation is rewording the question to break mm -hmm. it down to make it mm -hmm. fact based and not the higher level. Yeah, if he's on the right. spectrum, Deborah, then you want to stick to fact based questions as much as you can. Yeah, that's that's really good advice. Cause I think so many curriculums. <laughs> give us those non-fact based questions mm -hmm. and they, they, they're so have to be so intuitive I, I remember my daughter even coming to me and saying what are they really asking for mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know smart because, kid yes and so um we we forget that the way the curriculum may ask questions and when you're looking at curriculum how how does your child interpret those questions and are they ready to answer those types of questions or not? Or right. like you said, do you need to accommodate with some more rewarding it. Or rewarding. rewarding it? If or you've just, got an older student, um, Peggy, I found that I uh, ask them to read the questions before they read the material. Yes. Because the, the textbooks are almost always, except for one book that we had in eighth grade when I was in the public school that completely messed this whole idea up. But generally, it's a question, and the material is going to be the first part of the chapter, and the second question is the next part of the chapter. And so read the question, and then I promise you, you won't have to go back at the end of the chapter to find your answers. You've already got them. Answer one question at a time. And the right. kids loved it because they didn't have as much homework. Mm -hmm. I think we learned, I, I definitely learned that as a public school student. And so I pointed that out to my children, I remember once, and they're like, oh, Okay, so the, this answer is here, and then that answer is here. It's like, yeah, it's almost like a guide, a reading exactly, guide. Exactly, exactly. Give you in the questions. And, and I like, find I find it's important as homeschool parents, you know, teach your child how to use the book, mm. especially for older kids. I mean, the younger kids, this is kind of, um, uh, it's not really relevant, I think, for very young kids. But for older kids, we've we've got to give them tools that they can learn how to benefit from the book. Look at the maps, look at the questions, look at the graphs, look at the charts, look at the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And and for goodness sakes, let the questions form the magnets that you begin to try to find answers that we'll meet up with. Mm -hmm. And again, that's another reason to look for good curriculum. If they ask the right. good questions like that, you're going to have a resource to yes. be able to use in that manner. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So we got Five minutes left. Deborah said, "Thank you." Um, You're welcome. He does have issues answering abstract questions. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. And that will be a battle that you're going to face, Deborah, for the next twelve years. I mean, I'll be honest with you, but that doesn't mean that you can't teach him and that you won't find something that does work for him. Yeah, so that's 
stay with his passions and keep it factual. My book has a lot of ideas. There's a whole chapter on helping working with kids on the spectrum. So let's talk about that because we just got a couple minutes left. This is Judy's book. It's um, teaching a child special needs um, at home and at school. And where can parents get this? I know right. I'll put the link up when I'm done. I'll put it on the feed as well. So everybody that's made comments will get that link too. Right. It is available on Amazon.com. If price is a factor, which was set by the publisher, if it were by me, I'd have it practically give away because I want parents to know how to do it. Um, but it can be bought on Amazon.com, teaching a child to um, teaching a child with special needs at home and at school. It also comes as an ebook. You can download it as a Kindle book, and I just found they've lowered the price to something like $7.95. Great. Now, I have a lot of reproducible pages um, in the book the parents can mm -hmm. use, and I have had one parent come back and say it was very difficult to use the download um, book well, the to Kindle get the version get, for that. Yeah, yeah. For that. Um, but, uh, you know, if you've downloaded the Kindle, you're certainly welcome to, to reach me, and I will try to provide you with a page that you might be particularly interested in. So I'm, I'm all about making sure that parents have access to the help if they need it. So mm -hmm. Amazon.com. You may be able to just get it by putting in my name, but Peggy's going to give you the link as well. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's wonderful. And um, so any closing advice that you want to give to our parents? We, we just thank you all, first of all, for all of your, your great questions and comments. We definitely mm -hmm. have appreciated those. And it's been a great conversation tonight. Yeah. Uh, final advice. The curriculum is very much under your control but you mm -hmm. want to make sure that you find curriculum that is going to be a good match for your child. Um, you take charge of the curriculum if it's not working well and if it absolutely cannot be made any more effective and appropriate for your child, don't be afraid to try something different. It, it's so important to find that you've got something that you can work with. And there are options. There are online options. There are um, hands-on programs. As, as Peggy has said, there are unit approaches. Mm -hmm. There's going to be something out there. So the important thing is don't feel like it's you who may be the problem as a teacher. I find more kids that are curriculum disabled than kids that are learning disabled. Mm. So so oh, be, be that's really good advice. <laughs> yes. Be willing, be willing to realize that it may be a problem with the curriculum. And I do have a whole chapter in my book on guidelines. I just hinted at a few of them, but it's it's not about the brand. It's not about what worked for your best friend and not about what you use for your kid who was three years before. It's mm -hmm. about what's a good match for your child and, and also for how you work. If it requires yeah. you to do a lot of grading, it may not be something you can do because you've got a toddler in diapers and you've got another one and you've got an older one who's got behavior issues and you just cannot keep up with that. So you have to mm -hmm. find something that works for you and your child. Right. Yeah. And it can be the like the golden curriculum that everyone says will solve all these problems. But if you're going crazy and pulling your hair out, <laughs> it's not worth it. No, it's not. You have to decide what hills you're willing to die for. And as I said earlier, with one of the earlier questions, if it requires a lot of writing and your kid cannot write, that's not necessarily the hill you need to die for. You may want to go and adapt that to just take the oral answers for a while. You may yeah. find that there's a season, and like she said, her, her, her son, you know, where he learned to read later. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's it's not, there's no magic bullet. There really isn't a magic bullet. It's it's a learning process. And fortunately, you as a homeschool parent get to choose. Yeah. You don't have somebody telling you what book you're going to use or how fast you're going to use it or how long you have to get it finished. It's it's mm -hmm. up to you to find what, what really works best. And right. don't be afraid to ask for help. Mm -hmm. if, there's a, if, there's a, if there's a person nearby or there's a Facebook group that's talking about these things, there are wonderful resources and you don't have to do it alone. So so please be willing to reach out. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's not definitely it's, it's not a make or break for you alone. You don't have to walk this journey alone anymore. I mean, I'm sure, you know, back when Peggy started, it was pretty much all up to her. Yeah, I went to homeschool conferences and I, I told people when I spoke at this last one, I, I went home and cried. It, you know, because I really had no resources. And, you know, yeah. that's what we want to make these videos for you to understand that there's people that have been there, done that, have expertise like Judy that you can um, you can go to. And Judy's on our website and she does consulting. So yes, you can find her under our consultants page um, if you want to connect with her. And um, 
and and she can work with you one on one and, and walk you through this too if you have lots of questions. And yes, there are a lot of communities. Um, I would recommend our support group on Facebook above any others because um, we don't turn the comments off because they're so bad. I know some do, um, but um, we do monitor that group quite well. And, you know, instead of asking what curriculum should I use, say, this is a curriculum I'm looking at. Have any of you used this? And these, this is what my child does best with. This is what they struggle with. Is it a good choice? Because I think this is what Judy was getting at now. You know, you were, you were definitely saying, ask the, ask the right questions. Yeah. We have to ask the right questions and we have to know what those questions are and they're about our child. Right. Um, and there's a little post up here by Michelle asking if we have resources in particular. Um, the list is too long to recognize. I, I have a whole appendix with a, about a couple hundred. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so, check out the curriculum picks on the Sped Homeschool website. Those are parent recommended. A lot yeah. of them are very multi-sensory, very easy to adapt curriculums um, that you can make more customizable, but still talk to those providers, check them out, try them out. Don't think yes. that we have lists. There's a reason that there's many recommended it's because there's no one perfect choice. That's right. And if you find that you're running a little behind, please don't get in a panic. This is not, this is not a mar this, this is not a foot race. This is a marathon. Mm -hmm. So be kind to yourself. If you run into some snags or your child's not making progress for the moment, please be mm -hmm. kind to yourself and be willing to just if you were making a trip and, and you feel like you missed one of your turns, the journey is not all over. You just do a roundabout and you go back and look for the road sign for the next turn. Exactly. Yep. So, so be kind to yourself. Mm, so such good advice. Thank you, Judy, so much. This hour was very short. We may have to have you back. <laughs> well, next time, hopefully my computer will be familiar and I won't have such anxiety about it. I'll be, I'll be happy to join you again. You did awesome. Mine failed. I'm gonna have to make a cut in the middle where we had some, <laughs> some issues, but, but that's easy to do. Um, so, so thank you again. And I'm, I think our viewers would, would say with me, you are a wealth of information and we thank you for that. sharing with us. Um, glad, glad to be here. Yeah, definitely. So I want to thank the Learning Disabilities Foundation of America for partially funding our broadcast and also for viewers like you who donate to our nonprofit on our, our website at spedhomeschool.com. Um, I will put up the link on how to find Judy's book uh, on this feed after we get off here. Um, but next week you can also join us. We're, it's our last week talking about curriculum and um, we're gonna be interviewing Michael Maloney from the Maloney Reading Method. And he's gonna talk about what parents can do to ensure effective homeschool instruction. And so we, I'm, I know he is an avid believer of direct instruction, which Judy was talking about. So if that intrigues you, then next week, we'll, you'll definitely want to be joining us for that interview as well. Mm -hmm. We're going to dive into that subject. And well. again, don't don't get bound by one person's method. Adapt exactly. it if you need to. Mm -hmm. Always, always, always. Be, be free yes. to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have freedom. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. It is. So. It's one of the best things about homeschooling. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. And um, we'll see you again next week. Bye. Good night.